Well, church, my name is Rachel, and I'm just so excited to be here with all of you this morning. If you're a first-time guest, we want to say a special welcome home to you. We're so glad that you're joining us. You'll find these green Connect cards on the seat backs in front of you and also some QR codes that you can scan. If you would fill out that green Connect card or scan the QR code and fill out the form, we would love to meet you and give you a gift. So if you turn it into the green table out there, it's called Guest Services. We would love, like I said, to just meet you and give you a free gift. We're so excited that you're joining us this morning. Now, many of you that have already been here at Meadows might know that we have a purpose statement. And we like to remind you guys every week of what it is. So how about this week, if you know it, say it with me. Our mission here at Meadows is to lead people to Christ and their God-given purpose. Good job. Some of you did real good. And it was in sync. That's awesome. Um, but yeah, our, our mission here at Meadows is a, to find lost people, and then B, to help them find their purpose. And we just love walking alongside each of you as you do that. Now, something that we also know is that we can't help people find Christ or find their purpose if they're not getting in the word, if they're not coming to church. And so we love having events that you guys can just invite people to, to get them into the doors. So next week on Sunday at 1230, right after the second service, we're going to be having our first ever Cool Beans Chili Cook-Off. Yeah. Yeah, we're really excited. So not only is there going to be a chili cook-off, but it's also just going to be a nice potluck. We can come together as a family, um, just have some food. We're going to have football on the big screens. Um, so, so excited for that. If you're interested in helping out with a potluck or if you're interested in being involved in the chili cook-off, you can go to our website, and there should be a button there for you to click that says Cool Beans Chili Cook-Off. Sign up to bring something. Um, sign up for chili. We're so excited to just have fun together as a family next Next week. Now, something else that we love doing every week is just thanking you um, for those of you that give here at Meadows. We wouldn't be able to do what we do without you guys. So from the bottom of our hearts, thank you for giving to the church. And we love reminding you that when you give to the church, you're not necessarily giving to just a building. You're not giving to just paychecks. You're giving to life change. You're giving to allow us to go out into the communities and change the communities around us. And most of you know that we have two main um, communities or populations that we're really passionate about here at Meadows. We have our veterans, and we also have our foster families or our foster children. So this Christmas, we're going to have a fun experience um, to be able to help foster children. I'm going to invite up Sean Riddle from Priority Family Services to tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, I give it up for Sean. So we've kind of already partnered with Priority Family Services um, in the past, but this year I think is our first time partnering with them for Christmas. So he's going to tell us a little bit about that. Good morning. Thank you for letting me come. I will start this with, I'm an emotional dude, and I'm already feeling it. What, what an amazing presence of the Holy Spirit is here. This is church. I was t I'm here with my daughter, and I said, what if the Holy Spirit broke out while we're here? We're ready for that. You guys have something so amazing here. Um, I am on, here on behalf of Party Family Services, and I want to tell you, that song that you guys just sang where you said you, you picked up all the pieces and you put it back together, you guys are the physical practice of that. We understand that the children we're serving are, are so broken in so many ways, physically, emotionally, spiritually, and we're a faith-based organization, and I mean that. We, we, don't say we're, we don't say we're a church. We say we're a ministry, and we're about bringing healing to everybody we serve. We have learned that that's not just the children that we're serving and their families, but even the people that work with us. God is doing an amazing thing, and you guys have stepped, stepped, stepped to the side of us and said we will help support that. And I can't tell you what that means because not everybody's doing that. You know, it's that old situation where, you know, you're driving by on the interstate and you see a car, it's got a flat tire, and you think, oh, someone's gonna, someone else will do that. Someone else is going to stop. Nobody else is doing this. I promise you, nobody else is doing I've been doing this for 20 years. And you guys stepped up and said, I'm going to do this. And so this, this year we have our Christmas still, and it's, I think we're calling it Adopt an Angel. I don't, I don't know the term that you guys are referring to it as. Adopt, even better. Um, <laughs> adopt a Child. Uh, you guys are providing um, toys for those children. And I can't tell you what that means to these children. I, I think many of you can understand that. A lot of these children have not had a Christmas. They've not had birthdays. They've not had anything. And 
You guys are providing the opportunity for these children to have two, three, four, five, six toys for a holiday. Yes, the foster parents are supposed to be doing that, but not, not just the numbers, but when they see there are other families coming beside, behind them and saying, hey, young man, young woman, I see you and I want to give to you, it means everything. Let me also thank you for everything you guys have been doing. You guys have given to our back to school event. Um, you guys went and did some trunk or treats at our Halloween and it, it doesn't go unnoticed by the families we're serving, but even our staff. I mean it when I say priority is here to serve everybody and you guys are doing that. And so I'm just, I'm so grateful. I'm shaking not because I'm ner nervous, I'm shaking because I'm so emotional and there's such a, a presence of the Holy Spirit here and you guys are allowing that to occur. You have something amazing here continue to be the physical act of putting all the pieces back together. So thank you, thank you, thank you for letting me be here. I will be out at the table. I'm not selling something. I keep telling out to everybody, I'm not there to sell anything. I'm just there to just share with you and let you know that I'm, I'm so grateful for everything you guys are doing. Thank you. Yeah, so like he said, he'll be out in the table in the Welcome Center. Check it out if you're interested in helping out with um, those presents for those kids. And I just got to say, I think there are 86 kids, and I'm sure that every single one of them are going to be taken today because that's the kind of church that you guys are. So just thank you so much in advance for doing that. Now we're going to go into a time of prayer. We're just going to pray over each other, pray over the church as a whole, pray over Pastor Monty, and then we're going to pray the Lord's Prayer together. And guys, that's something that I just love doing. We can speak the same prayer together as a family, believing the words that we say. So let's go to the Lord right now. Father, just overcome with, with your presence right now, Lord. Overcome with the opportunity that you give us every week to come together as a family and just worship and praise you. I love the message that we're in right now, the unsaved Christian. It's just so eye-opening to me and I'm sure to many others that we're not called to be cultural Christians. We're called to be people after your heart. And I believe the words that we've been singing this morning that, that we want to move your heart, Father. I thank you that you defend our hearts. You pick up the pieces and put us back together. So, so thankful for that this morning, Lord. I want to pray over specifically the people in this room right now. I know we've all had some heavy weeks over the past couple months, so I pray that you would just come into this place right now. Pray that your presence would be so tangible. Your spirit would just fill the room, Lord. Sometimes I get caught up in thinking that I can only feel your presence when we're singing or when we're praying, but your presence is here throughout the whole day, Lord. So I pray during the message we would feel you. I pray when we're out in the Welcome Center talking to one another that we would feel you. I pray as we leave the church today that we would carry you with us and we would be you to those around us, Lord. We just love you so much want to pray over anyone serving right now, God. Just so thankful for their hearts and thankful that we're able to do what we do on a Sunday because of them. Praying over the kids and the children's services right now. Believing you're going to move in big ways in that room as well, Father. Pray over Pastor Monty right now and his family as, as we'll soon find out they're not here this morning, Lord. But I believe that you're just going to give them such a time of rest believing that this message is going to be so good. We love you so much, Lord. Let's pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Hey, what is up, Meadows Church? It is so good to be with you. I want to welcome you here. All of those watching online, we want to welcome you too. Um, we are, I'm so excited for today. So by now you probably noticed something that uh, I'm not actually physically there. Uh, and if you haven't realized that, uh, 
we want to pray for you after the service, because you should really know that by now. But uh, the reason we're not is because my family and I are out of town, and uh, I know you're probably wondering, well, where are you at now? So, but you know what is easier for me? Rather than tell you where we went, how about I show you? That's right. We are going to see the Dallas Cowboys making memories with the family. We couldn't pass the opportunity. I know you're jealous. I can see it on your faces. Um, we are heading to Minneapolis, or we're in Minneapolis, going to go watch uh, the Cowboys crush the Minnesota Vikings in Jesus' name, of course, and everybody said. Okay, I hope you said amen. I need you with me in this. But we are, we're super excited. But, but know this, I, I knew I needed to bring the message to you as well because the message today is so personal to me and to our church. So I'm excited to bring it to you. And I promise it's going to be just like I was there, only no spit, right? So uh, I'm excited about the game. But anyway, let me get back into preaching mode. And we're back. So, hey, real quick, before I get into the message, I got to share something huge with you. Um, repeat after me. Say December 11th. Write that date down. That date is, um, will be our year-end faith offering. We started this last year, and this is an offering where uh, we, we give above and beyond. And the theme is always expansion. Say expansion. Why is that the theme? Because God wants to expand the territory of, of us reaching people for Jesus of us going after lost people, of us reaching our friends and family, our neighbors, our coworkers, our communities. And you fund that. We fund that together. So, by the way, most of our community is not reached. I hope you know that. E e stats vary, but it's way over half of the people in the Omaha area are, 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 are not a believer in Jesus, not following Jesus, not seeking him, nothing. So there's nothing greater that you can give to. We started this last year, and let me tell you what happened. We, we raised over $20,000. Our goal this year is over $30,000. And this is, this is what I'll, I'll say to you. I'll give you one scripture to pray over over the next few weeks. Here it is. 2 Corinthians 9, 7. Each of you must decide in your hearts how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. Okay? For God loves a What? Someone who gives cheerfully, or a cheerful giver. There's your scripture to pray over. And you can start giving, watching online. This is for you too. Wherever you're watching from, you can start giving now. Online, you, you can go to uh, the ways to give and select the drop down. It says year-end faith offering, or you could just note that at Venmo or texting. But, but understand something. Um, last year, we saw miracles. We saw people that had never given give for the first time, and this prompted it. We saw people that were giving sporadically just whenever they felt like they could maybe do it, and they started to give consistently. We saw people that were maybe giving consistently, and they started to tithe, which is like 10% of returning it back to God, which is what you, the goal in the word of God. And we saw, we saw givers who, who tithe, they returned to God, and they gave above and beyond to, to, where, to where it even got uncomfortable. And, and that's, that's what I want you praying about. December 11th is our year-end faith offering. Uh, Let's pray with each other about it, and let's watch what God does. I've already, you need, we're, we're gonna, and it calls for sacrifice. I told Jody, only one trip to Target every week, okay? Ten minutes max, and uh, I'll supervise. So anyway, so we've all got to make sacrifices, but, but seriously, I'm so excited about this. When, when a lot of churches are maybe in maintenance mode, or even just hold the fort mode, we'll never be in that, ever. We put the metal to, down. We put the pedal down, and we're going forward and reaching people in Jesus' name, and we will not stop. And, and, and you and I together are helping fund to make that happen. There is no greater investment in the world. All right, I want to ask you a question as we start today's message. Can you remember a time in your life when you were absolutely shocked? Like, you got some news, something happened. Uh, maybe, maybe you found out you were pregnant, and you're just shocked. Actually, you shouldn't be that shocked. They've narrowed down how that happens. But anyway, so maybe it was that. Maybe, maybe you took a test. You thought you bombed it. You got the test back and you aced it. You were shocked. Maybe you went and, you, maybe you went and saw the Minnesota Vikings play and they actually won. You were, sorry, still thinking football. Um, but you, maybe you asked her out and you thought you had no chance, but she said yes. Somebody asked me one time, they're like, Monty, were you shocked when you proposed to Jody? And uh, she said yes. I'm like, that didn't shock me. 
It shocked me that Jody went out with me in the first place. I mean, honestly, that was the shock. But the, one of the biggest shocks to answer the question for me happened three and a half years ago. Three and a half years ago, on a Thursday night, a cop comes up to the house, rings the doorbell. I open the door. There he's standing. My first thought, what did Jody do now, right? Actually, that's not true. I was like, what did Jake do? But uh, it wasn't either of them. It was uh, a question that he asked me. And he asked, um, do you own a trailer? And I'm like, no, don't own a trailer. And then he said, Meadows Church? And I was like, oh, boy. Yeah, Meadows owns a trailer. It's parked where we do church in this hotel parking lot with all of our gear in it. And he said, well, it's not parked in that parking lot with all your gear in it. It's actually in Council Bluffs with all your gear in it on fire. And I have to tell you, when I heard that, I was shocked. That is about the last thing I expected to hear. And if you've never heard the whole story, it's, it's insane. But God taught us that uh, one more time he taught us the church isn't the chairs, the church isn't the building, the church isn't the, the, the platform or the pulpit, but the church is the people. And church would continue that weekend and every weekend after. And, uh, but I tell you, I was shocked in that moment. We're in a series called The Unsaved Christian. I believe, for me, it's the most important series I've ever taught. Um, and you'll, you'll see why in just a minute. But, but the series centers around a couple things that Jesus said in Matthew 7. Jesus is giving uh, a famous sermon, a Sermon on the Mount. You may have heard of it. Um, this is towards the end of that, that, that sermon. And Jesus makes a statement in verse 13 and 14, which, uh, which I won't, uh, I, you can see that from last week. I'll paraphrase it for you. How about that? Um, Jesus basically says, most people are going to hell. I mean, in, not in those words, but that's what he says. He says, the road to hell is wide and easy, and many go there. The road to heaven, few go there. That's shocking. That is extremely shocking, because unless you're an absolute atheist, pretty much everybody, if you were to ask them, would, would assume that, that they're going to heaven. In fact, one of the studies I looked up uh, said 2% of people in America said, if I die and I believe in the afterlife, I know I'm going to hell. 2%. But Jesus said, most, many. So something's off. So the, the scripture I do want to show you where we're going to park again today is a few verses later in Matthew 7, 21. Jesus is still talking about it, and, and he's, he's desperately wanting us to get something. And I believe he's desperately wanting you and I to get it today. He said it 2,000 years ago, and it's it, just, just take this in what he says. Shocking. Jesus said, not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, many, say many, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we did these great things in your name. We prophesied in your name. We cast out demons in your name. We healed people in your name. They, they knew Jesus. They, they said, we did these things. And Jesus says this. This is crazy. Shocking. But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's law. Today I want to take you on a journey a journey that I would call uh, the tale of three chairs. And uh, if you will, just go with me on this for a second. Three chairs, you see them on the stage. You're sitting in one of them, and so am I. In fact, everybody is. Let me kind of define what they are. Chair number one is the unbeliever. This person, they, they do not believe you know, in Jesus or the gospel, they are, boy, that's a tough one to spell. They are, I hope that's right. <laughs> they are unbelievable. Okay, well, they are unbeliever. It is unbelievable after you know Jesus, but they're an unbeliever, okay? Say unbeliever. Also in this category on chair number one would be people that are um, not only atheists, which is an op they don't believe in God, agnostic, they're like, mm, God might be real, he might not be, whatever. Um, other religions would fall under this category in chair number one. Uh, a Muslim, a Hindu. Um, it, let me put it this way. 
anybody sitting on chair number one, if you, if you told them they weren't a Christian, they're not going to argue with you. They're like, no, I'm not. You're right. You, you're, you nailed it. So that's chair number one, okay? Some of you today, I, in fact, I'll say it. I hope some of you today are sitting in that chair. It's crazy to say that in a church, but the moment a church has nobody that, that, that is not believing and everybody's just hanging around believing and everybody's, you know, singing kumbaya, we failed. We're going after people that don't believe. We're going after people that don't know. We're going after people that have questions. So if that's you, I'm glad you're here. Thank you for being here. That's chair number one. Chair number two, this is believer. This is the believer. This is, okay, let me, let me um, get more specific because that's important. Chair number two is an authentic believer. They, are, they have responded to the gospel of Jesus Christ by faith. They have put their faith, trust, and hope and everything into Jesus. Their life revolves around it. Like, like every decision that they make, every, everything they do, they're running through the lens of the word of God. They're running through the lens of what Jesus taught. This, I wrote down, this person has Christian conviction drawn from the Bible that impacts their life every day. So you got the unbeliever and the believer. That's chair number two. That would be, this would be the goal. This is where we want to be. So, chair number three. You ready? Say, I'm ready. All right. Chair number three is also a believer. So, so what's the difference with chair number three? What makes it different than chair number two? Well, it's what the series is all about. The many that Jesus would refer to in Matthew 7, many will say, Lord, Lord, we did these things. The, the wide road that leads to, to destruction, that's, 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 that's these roads here. This is where most people are. It, it, God revealed this to me, that our, our target, do we want to reach atheist, agnostic? Absolutely, and we will. Where we live in the Midwest, that's not the, probably the biggest target. This is. It's the people sitting in church right now. Could, could be you. I don't know. This is what we're praying about. I just ask you to be, is it? So, so this is what we've been calling um, a cultural Christian. In fact, I'm going to write that somewhere if I can. Cultural, cultural. I should have spelled these out before I did the message, but I, you know, just by faith, that's how you got to live. So that's a cultural. This is a believer, but a cultural cl- Christian. They admire Jesus. They've done, they've done, they've done a lot of the rituals and things, but but something is missing. Ooh, that's, a good, that's, that's what I want you to know. There's something that, that this chair, there's something that this person has that this person doesn't. That's the key. That's what you're going to get today. But I want to show you something. Because the reason so many people, the reason those people in the scripture were so shocked, they're like, are you kidding me, Jesus? We did all those things, and we're not going to spend forever with you? And Jesus is like, that's right. In fact, he said, get away from me. Because he can have nothing to do with him for some reason. Why? So, This is what I want to give you today, four barriers, four things that I believe will will prevent many of us, prevented me most of my life from, from, because I always believed, you would have never talked me out of, I'm on chair number two, I believe in Jesus, I I went to Catholic grade school, I I knew some Bible verses, Um, I've never doubted uh, the resurrection, oh, I was here, something was missing, say missing, that's right, something was missing, so what is keeping all the masses, the many, what are keeping them from really believing that they're, they're here? What, what, why are they believing that? I think there are, there's barriers. So I'm going to give you barriers that will prevent us from, from really seeing that we're on chair number three. Remember, everybody's on a chair. You're on a chair and so am I. And, and, and the question is, where are we? Barrier number one that will prevent you from understanding that you might be on chair number three is your heritage and your tradition. The way you were brought up. You know, I was brought up with a, in a good home, and we had good values, and, and my mom and dad, they would, they would bring me to church occasionally. And, uh, you know, we, 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 we knew some scripture, and we were, we were how did I put it, um, I got to find what I wrote. Oh, yeah. So, gra- grandma, my, my granddad was a Christian, and my, my, my mom was a Christian, and, you know, my, my grandma would, would read me or teach me prayers at night, and we would do these things. We had these things that we did as a family, like, like we did. Like, growing up Catholic, many nights, my mom with six kids, 
would, I've told you this before, she would line us up around a bed on our knees, and we each had a rosary. Now, if you don't know what a rosary is, that probably means that you just didn't grow up Catholic, but a rosary is like the necklace with all the beads on it and got the cross at the end, and there's 59 beads on a rosary. And when you pray the rosary, you pray a prayer for all 59. That's right. So if you want to get to bed by 10, you need to start at about 845 to have any chance whatsoever. So, but, but we did that. We had that tradition. But yet something, with me anyway, was missing. Now listen to me. It, I think it's great. If your parents got you to church, I think it's awesome. I think, I think parents should do that. You know, and I think it's great if grandma did, you know, read you bedtime stories at night in the Bible about a, 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 a shepherd slaying a giant. But here's the thing. If it's not truly your faith, it's not faith. It's got to be yours. It can't be your granddad's. It can't be your mom's. I'll say it a different way. God doesn't have grandchildren. None. Zero. He's got children. People that have been saved by grace through faith, um, authentic, the authentic believers in share number two, they're, chil- they're, they're a child of God. That's, that's what they are. That's what the Bible would say. But, but God don't have grandchildren. God doesn't have grandchildren. I wrote, many cultural Christians see themselves as being born into Christianity rather than being born again. Barrier number two, say two. Religious ceremonies, religious events. I was was confirmed. I had, you know, confirmation. Many of you, raise your hand. Who was confirmed? Yeah, quite a few of us were confirmed, right? Who's been baptized? That's another religious ceremony. And these aren't bad things. Yeah, baptism, first communion. Uh, you, these are things that we do, but, but they don't save us. Like, I'm excited. We got, we'll have baptisms coming up, I hope, at, at the end of the year. And, uh, but baptism, it doesn't save you. Baptism is a declaration, an announcement, a, a symbol that you're saved. That's so important you catch this. I... Um, one of the craziest, well, I've had a lot of crazy conversations, but uh, a friend, a fr- more of a, an acquaintance that I knew or I ran into, um, this, is, this is years ago, and he, he knew I was a pastor, and he said, hey, we just, had a, we just had a son, and I was like, oh, that's awesome, congratulations, and he said, we want to get him baptized, you guys baptize at your church, and uh, I said, we do, but I said, we don't, we don't do baby baptisms, and I explained to him the whole thing, there's you know, the Bible doesn't have any baby baptisms, and so we do it when people are old enough and make a decision for themselves, and then they get baptized. That's what the Bible shows and all this stuff. And so we dedicate kids or babies because Jesus was dedicated when he was eight, all this stuff. And as I'm explaining it, he's just looking at me like, what are you talking? He, it was just speaking a different language, and he came back here after I was done explaining, and he said, so, so can, can our son get baptized at your church? <laughs> and I was like, so I asked him, I said, Why? I said, why do, you want him, why do you want to baptize? Why do you want to get him baptized? And he's like, it's like he's almost like, duh. He goes, oh, well, I, I was baptized as a baby, and oh, we want him to be baptized. It's, it's, it's the right thing to do. And I said, why? And I kept going back to why. And I think he fr- it frustrated him enough, but he really didn't have an answer to the question. Well, the answer is, it's what he knows. It, it, it's what, we, what we've done. It's what was done for me, so we just do it. How many times do we do things we don't even know why? This is why we need to get into the word of God. So, so they did get their son baptized at another church. I saw the pictures online. Looked, looked, the church looked awesome. Stained glass windows, wooden pews, a great setting. And my, my, my acquaintance, my friend, he, he would tell you he hadn't been to church in dec- two, probably two decades. But why was he so adamant to get his son to church and him dress up, his wife dress up, grandma and grandpa be there, uh, picking a godfather and a godmother to be there, uh, their son all dressed in a white gown, all beautiful, and then only to be done later that day, put the clothes away, put the gown away, and start living life again. Why was he so adamant? Why, why do we do what we do? Why do we, we, we need to understand why we're doing these things. That's barrier number two. Barrier number three, I was going to say is electronics, but this just turned on in the, in the name of Jesus. So that's great. So, and this one's going to, this one might, might throw you a little bit, to think that belief could be a barrier. Say belief. Belief. Believing in God. Believing in heaven. Believing in the Bible stories. How, Pastor, whoa, pull back here. How could believing be a barrier 
to really embracing the gospel of Jesus. Well, here's how, and this should be on the screen for you. Believing in God doesn't make you a Christian. There's a lot of people in hell who believe in God. I'll take it a step farther, and this might really cause a little tension, but I'd rather cause tension in love from the Word of God than you not hear it from, from anybody. Believing in Jesus Believing in Jesus doesn't make you a Christian. Pause there for a second. We'll come back to that. James, the brother of Jesus, if you read 2.19, I don't have the scripture up there, but in James 2.19, I'll paraphrase, the devil believes, the demons believe, they all believe. James was unimpressed with a belief that did not result in living for Christ unimpressed. In fact, you know what he called it. He called that faith dead. That's what he called it. He called that belief. Belief is another word for faith. That belief is dead. I'll say it this way. Knowledge alone does not equate in saving, does not equate to saving faith. Knowledge by itself does not equate to saving faith. Belief could be a barrier. I think it is for many people. And the fourth one might be as big. The statement that many of us have believed and said, I'm a good person. I'm a good person. And because I'm a good person, I'm good to go, right? I mean, I'm not, I'm not out there doing bad things purposely. I'm not out there, you know, uh, hurting people or robbing people or breaking the law. I mean, yeah, I speed occasionally, but only to get to church on time. Oh, if that's the case, some of you need to speed a little bit more. You know who you are. I see you. I see you. I, uh, so, I'm a good person. I love my family. I vote my values. I'm raising my kids right. Oh, I have to tell you something. I, I really had that feeling this week. Like, I thought as a pastor, because sometimes I think I'm missing, I'm missing it with the kids, you know. And Ava, my daughter, junior in high school, comes up to me, and she's giving me uh, her homework. It wasn't homework that she had gotten back yet. It was homework that she was going to turn in. So Ava, Ava hands me her homework and says, Dad, I want you to look over my homework and read it and blah, blah, blah. So I'm looking at it, and it was for a literature class. And you guys, it was like out of a movie. So one of the questions was, what was one of the first questions? I wrote it down. There was multiple questions, but I don't want to go through all that. You guys you got time for that. So, um, oh, it said, describe yourself. Describe who you are. And Ava, I'm not kidding you. She wrote... Um, and, and my kid doesn't go to, you know, they don't go to a Christian school. They go to a public school. And she wrote, I am a daughter of the Ch King Jesus. I, I have been wonderfully and fearfully made. I'm a masterpiece. And I was like, yes, you go. And the, like one of the next questions was, uh, I got to find it here. It said, it's a funny question. It says, who are your enemies? Like, who, who, who aren't you getting along with? I don't know what, I don't know why, but it asked that question. And Abel's like, I don't have really anybody that I don't like or that, that, that I'm an enemy with. My only enemy is the devil. And I was like, oh, yes, preach, girl. And then, and then one of the final questions was like, what do you want, to, what, what is your goal in life? You know what she wrote? I want to lead people to Christ and their God-given purpose. The mission of the church has become her mission. And I'm like, uh, it was like a fairy tale. It was like Jesus himself was giving me this great big hug. It felt so good. I was like, yes, I nailed it. And there was like three pages, so I still had one page left. So I flipped the second page to the third page, and the third page is a speeding ticket that Ava just got a couple days ago. And I'm like, I think I've been set up. <laughs> I, but I got to give, I, I give her credit. She did a good job. She got dad in a good mood. Uh, and the fact that it was a warning and not a ticket also helped me become in a good mood. Otherwise, her God-given purpose would have been probably scrubbing toilets for the next week. But anyway, so <laughs> smart girl. But, but So we do these great things, and it makes us feel like we're a good person. But let me ask you a question if it's about good. How good is good enough? What, what, what's the tipping point? Is it Billy Graham good? I mean, that's a pretty high bar. Is it Mother Teresa good? Or is it just like Patrick Mahomes good, right? I don't know. I don't know why I use that. It's just thinking football still probably, but he's not as squeaky clean as you think he is. I'm just saying. But, but, but how good is good enough? 
what is the point? God answers the question. Romans 3.23, no good is good enough. Everyone has sinned. Everyone is jacked up. That's the MLT, Monty Living Translation. Everybody's jacked up. We all, say all. Yeah, we all fall short of God's standard. You can't, Billy Graham falls short? Yep. Mother Teresa, she's not good enough? That's right. But my Grammy, my sweet little Grammy, listen, your Grammy was a heathen compared to God. Welcome to Medals, where we're here to make you feel good about yourself. So, uh, we all fall short. Your pastor falls short. This quote, I don't know who wrote it, but it wasn't me, but it was, I don't know who it was, but it said, I wouldn't trust the best, my best 15 minutes to get me into heaven. And you shouldn't, because it's still fallen. It's a fallen 15 minutes. So, I want to define some terms, because we live in a world where people, people define, redefine, um, morph, change, twist, all kinds of things into our own narrative to fit us so it makes us feel good about ourselves or what we do or how, what we, you know, who we hang with and all these things. But I don't want to know what, what the world's definition or even my definition, I want to know what God says. And, and I believe you do too. Here's the definition of, 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 of sin. This is according to the Bible, uh, It's really the best thing I can come up with. The word literally means to miss the mark. Like the mark is perfection. That's God. He is a perfect God. He is a righteous God. He is a sinless God. And and so a Bible is, or excuse me, a sin isn't a, it's not a mistake or an oops or my bad. That's not sin. Sin is any violation against God's standard. Any violation. Against God's perfect standard. Again, to miss the mark. Sin goes against the nature of who God is. He can have nothing to do with this. And listen, if we're honest, if I'm honest, if you're honest, many of us, we want God to change the consequences of our sin without actually addressing the sin. God, don't worry about me messing up or the sin. Just, get, just take care of it. Just make it better. But don't ask me to change. I, I, I truly think Jesus is like, Jesus is like, before, before I can deal with the fruit of your sin, I need to deal with the root of your sin. That's what has to happen. That's what has to happen. We're getting closer to what's missing. I hope you're excited because this is good. Sin is why there's death. Sin is why we have funerals. Sin is why there's cancer. Sin is why there's heart attacks. Sin is why it was never never the plan. Thank God, God gives us a way out. Romans 3, or excuse me, 623 now. The wages, the result of sin is death. I I just shared that with you. But Jesus was sent to earth, became human, so that you and I might have life and have it to the full. That's good news. That is incredible. It's the best news in the world. That's why Jesus came. But understand this. Jesus, God, I hope you get this. Jesus doesn't just save us from our sin or from something. Jesus saves us to something. Say to. That's right. He, he, he saves us to a different way to a better way, to a a different way of living, a different way of loving, a different way of thinking. Now we're getting on to something. A different way of thinking. Jesus will change the way you think when his Holy Spirit is in you. There's the peace. There's There's a churchy word for that. You maybe have heard it before. It's repentance. Repentance it's just, a, it, it comes from the Greek word, I'm going to teach you some Greek, it comes from the Greek word metanoia. Say metanoia. Ooh, I love when you speak Greek to me. Metanoia, meta, meaning, meaning change. Noia, mean think, meaning think. So it's a change of thought. It, it's a change of your mind. That's what it means repentance is key. 
Not because your pastor is saying it, because Jesus said it. I'll show you that in a second. A second. But let, let me first get personal, because this is, I, it was me all my life, most of my life. That was me. Could be you, I don't know. Some, that's what we're here for. I look at my life, and it's like God was saying to me, Monty, where is the repentance? I, you always believe, where is the repentance? I, I kept thinking about it. I wanted God's goodness in my life, I wrote down, without turning from him, or, or without turning my life to him. I wanted God to cover the consequences of my, my sin rather than dealing with the sin that caused the consequences. That's what I wanted. And God is saying today, we need to repent. This is what's missing. That is one of the keys. It's what chair number two has. This believer has shown a change in the way they think. There is repentance. There is metanoia. There is a changing in the way that they're thinking. And there, listen, there are many, Jesus said it, many people believing in Jesus. Their thinking hasn't changed. They're still thinking the same way. And if you're thinking the same way, you'll be doing the same thing because your thinking determines what you do. And that determines your, your destination. It starts with thinking. That's why the word means to change the way you think. And the Lord can help you do that. This is, this is so huge. So now let's bring it back to the beginning. This will blow you away. Remember Jesus in Matthew 7, 21 through 23? Turn from me, I never knew you. Remember what he said at the end? If you don't, it's cool. I'll, I'll show you. Matthew 7, 23. But I will reply, by the way, they believed in Jesus, didn't they? The, the people in the illustration, they're like, Lord, they're calling him Lord. Lord, they're looking at Jesus. They believe in him. Like, they did miracles in Jesus' name. That means they believed in Jesus. They weren't saved. They believed in Jesus, and they weren't saved. So, Matthew 7, 23. But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me. You who break God's there it is. Do you see it? See, when there's no repentance, when, when there's no heart transformation, when there's no turning from and turning to, there's no repentance. What, you know what happens? The default happens. Sin. It's our default because we're born in that nature. So that, why are they breaking God's law? Be because they haven't repented. Because the, their, their, their thinking is still the same. So their doing is still the same. You who break God's law, if you're, if you're knowingly breaking the word of God, breaking God's law, and, and continually doing it with no, no, I mean, your only resolve might be feeling bad if you got caught. But other than that, there is no turning. There is no desire. I'm telling you, this is so huge. Changed my life. So now, so you know that it's not just me giving you my opinion because you don't want that. I'll close with scripture and let you hear it for yourself. Matthew 3, 9. John the Baptist has come on the scene to declare Jesus is coming, the Lord and Savior. What does John the Baptist say? Prove by the way that you live that you have repented from your sin and turned to God. He said nothing about believing. He said, prove by the way that you live. Okay, so now Jesus has been baptized by John the Baptist. He's starting his official ministry. What's the first thing Jesus says? Matthew 3, excuse me, 4, 17. From then on, Jesus began to preach. What did you preach, Jesus? I want to know. First word he says, repent. Not believe. Repent of your sin and turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Do you see it? There's no, just believe in me and you're good. Repent. It's the first thing he says. And the next, this, if I haven't convinced you yet, listen to what Jesus says next. Mark 1, 14 and 15. Later on, John the Baptist, he's been arrested. Jesus goes into Galilee where he preached God's good news. Here's what he said. 
The time promised by God has come at last, he announced. The kingdom of God is near. He says it again, and it's never been more near than it is today. The kingdom of God is near. And then what does he say? Here it is. Repent of your sin and believe the good news. Repent of your sin and believe the good news. And there it is. He, see, it's easy to see believing all over the place, and believing is a part, it's crucial. It's, it's a must, but it can't stop there. And we'll take Scripture here, we'll take Scripture there, and we'll put it on a t-shirt, put it on a post, put it on a mug. But, but Scripture was never made to just pluck and choose what you want. It is a love letter written to you from the Lord from start to finish, a journey that you go on together. And when you look at it in context, and you start to read it that way, Jesus, I'll say it again, repent of your sin. And believe the good news. Somebody, sometimes people will ask me, if, if the kingdom of heaven is so near, why doesn't it just happen? The world is so jacked up. It's not getting better, it's getting worse. Why doesn't Jesus just, I mean, the second coming, I believe in it, why don't Jesus just come back? Because he loves you. Peter, one of the best friends of Jesus, he answers your question. The Lord isn't being slow about his promise of coming back, as some people think. No, no, no. He is being patient for your sake. Why is he being so patient, Peter? He does not want anyone to be destroyed. I'll paraphrase. He doesn't want anybody to go to hell. And Peter finishes. What does Peter say? But he wants everyone to just believe in Jesus. It's not what he said. I want everybody to repent. I want everybody to turn. Don't be deceived anymore. Stop letting your belief stop you from truly believing and going all in. Because 95% in is 100% out. And there are many who are 95% in, but they know the 5% that they're out. What's yours if there is? This is so, this is just, oh, I love the word of God. It's so exciting to give it to you. He wants everyone to repent. God isn't waiting for people to believe in him. That's not why he's waiting. He's waiting for people to repent, turn from their sin, and turn to God and get all the glory he has for you. If you're not clapping right now, you should be clapping in the name of God. You've just been given the greatest news in the world that you would repent and turn. It's If, if the God you believe in, listen to this, requires no self-sacrifice, no obedience, no submission, no surrender, no repentance, you're not worshiping the God of the Bible. You're not. I can't tell you what God you're is, but I know what God you're not worshiping. It is. He has so much for you, but he wants all of you so you can truly experience all of him. Not just today, but today, tomorrow, next week, next month, next year, if you get that life long and forever. So what do we learn? I get worked up just as much on the screen as I do it live. I can't help it. I love the word of God. I love you. I love you. I don't, I, this message, I hope it doesn't, I'm not trying to make you feel bad. I'm just trying to show you how, it should make you feel great. The love of the Father and how clear he is in his word. The Bible shows us we're saved from our sin, but we are reconciled to our God. And that happens by those who repent and believe the gospel. Repent and believe. There are many who believe in Jesus. Many. Just ask them, they'll tell you. Is there change? Have they turned? Are, are they thinking differently? Are they, is their life different? God isn't looking and saying believe. I don't think he's saying that. He's saying repent. Salvation is belief and repentance. Salvation is belief and repentance. That will be controversial to probably a lot of people. That's why, I'm, that's why I'm telling you, you're not getting my opinion. I would never do that to you. I love you too much to give you my opinion. I want you in heaven forever. I want you to start living because heaven comes to earth as soon as you meet Jesus. You're saved by God's grace through faith when you believe. But when you truly believe in that and the Holy Spirit enters into you, you will be compelled to think differently. And if that's not happening, something's missing. And I'm telling you, according to Jesus, a lot of people are missing it. 
And I don't think Meadows Church is immune. So I want to pray for you. Before I do, I'm, I'm asking straight up, what chair are you sitting in? What chair are you really? And, and, and if the Holy Spirit is showing you that you might be sitting in chair number three as a cultural Christian, believing but truly living your life on your terms. And uh, there's a little piece of Jesus here and a little piece of Jesus there, but he doesn't have all of you. And you know that from maybe the way that you, you, you act or talk or, or, or post or joke when it's in private and all these things, the way maybe you treat your family when no one's watching or whatever it is, maybe the way you give or don't give, the way you love or don't love, the way you, the way you carry out the word of God, God's law, those who break God's law. What, what area? Ask the Holy Spirit to show you. He will. He loves you. And then let's, by faith right now, turn. Say it to God. God, I not only believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, died and rose for me, but, but I want to live for him. No longer living for me. No longer living for self. No longer living for my will, but I want your will. I want you to change the way I think. Ask him. He'll help you. Ask him. Pray with the prayer team after this. Ask him. This is so huge. Next week is the pinnacle of the, of, of the message or the series. There's invite cards on your chairs. I am praying that you will find somebody this week to give it to. People, most of our people need to hear it. People need to hear the hope and the love that Jesus has for them. And they need to know clearly how to respond to it. That's what I hope that I've given you today. I love you and God loves you more than I ever could. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you so much for your word and your truth. Oh, man, when we start to look at Scripture as a whole, because, okay, I'm, I've been guilty, God. God, I've got to confess. That's what part of church is, right, God? I've read the Bible, and I've been guilty. Man, that sounds good, and this sounds good. But you know what sounded good to me all the time? What was easy? What I could just do and say, I have did it, and it's done. But, but to truly allow you to change, man, there's some... There's some there's some, I mean, there's friction because it's our flesh, our sinfulness against your spirit. And, and there's a, it's a, but, but according to your Holy Spirit, we are overcomers. And in you, we can do all things. Scripture says these things and we believe it. So God, I pray for everybody, maybe uh, convicted right now, uh, wrestling right now. They need more prayer right now. Thank God they're here. I pray they let us pray with them and for them. I pray that any decisions for Christ where they're selling out 100% going all in, not just with belief, but with a change of thinking, with truly wanting to live differently, with truly wanting to turn from something and turn to something, that is metanoia. I pray metanoia is happening all over the place, not just in the room, but online as they watch from all over the world, God. I pray that they respond to the holy gospel of Jesus Christ. We are saved by God's grace through faith. And that faith is a biblical belief that includes repenting. That's what it is. Not because I'm saying it, but because your word says it over and over and over. Why? Because you want to make us feel bad? No. Because you love us. You love us so much that you, you made the biggest sacrifice in the world for us. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name I pray and we all say, amen. God bless you. Hey, I want to thank you so much for watching today, but don't stop there. I want to invite you to like or subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video, update, or message. But not only that, share this message with a friend. I mean, there are so many people out there hurting, struggling, and you have the ability to make an impact in their life. And finally, if, you're, if you live in the Omaha area, I want to encourage you, come join us on a weekend service. We would love, love to meet you. God bless you.